know, when a foal's born and it has an inability to extend, you know, either one or multiple joints at one time, it's reduced range of motion. And uh, although we call it contracted tendons, uh, it's not necessarily the tendon itself, but, you know, it's a complicated interaction between the muscles that are attached to those tendons, the angles of the joints they're involving, uh, all those sort of things, but that's just our common term for it. Uh, the severity can range from very mild, where just a little bit upright on the toes or a little bit upright on the fetlock, uh, to severe cases where they can be non-weight bearing. Um, I do want to kind of mention, uh, when you hear the term contracted foal syndrome, that's oftentimes when you have uh, severely affected joints and uh, there are often other birth defects that are involved with those. Uh, so the foals that come out looking like a crab or their uh, intestines are eviscerated, those sort of things. Uh, those typically aren't viable, uh, so we don't commonly attempt to treat those. So here are just a couple of examples of, you know, kind of the range. The one on the left is, uh, you know, slightly upright in its fetlock, and it's uh, unable to be weight-bearing on its heels, whereas the picture on the right here, uh, to my right, is, uh, you know, basically so flexed that it can't bear weight on that limb. So why do they occur? There have been various things that have been implicated, but not necessarily causative. We don't know exactly what the mechanism is or the true cause for uh, contracted tendons, but there are some things that are associated with it. And those could be toxins like loco weed or hybridized Sudan grass, uh, iodide toxicity goiter, uh, influenza, some neuromuscular diseases uh, that basically cause uh, denervation of the muscles. and uh, a very common theory is that there's basically not enough space within the uterus. Uh, you have a small pl placenta. There are some studies going on right now with uh, birth weights and trying to kind of isolate, you know, a truer cause for, for these things. Uh, interesting fact, though, mare age, uh, as well as uh, heritability, do not appear to be um, involved with it. And along the same line, it seems to uh, kind of come in spurts. It seems like some seasons there will be a lot more contracted foals than, than not, and the next year there may be less. Um, we did look at a number of foals treated uh, at the hospital, 102. Um, it's kind of interesting that more than 50% more were affected on the left hind. So, uh, you know, out of 102 foals, there were 129 limbs. So, you know, it just goes to show that it can be uh, oftentimes one single limb affected, but many times it's more than one. So treatment options, uh, basically starting kind of at your minimum would be uh, just bandaging alone. Uh, then we have uh, the ability to do splint bandages, uh, which is basically taking fiberglass cast material and applying that over a bandage on the uh, back of the limb to uh, extend those joints. Uh, oxytetracycline is, uh, is commonly used. It's something that should be done with caution in certain scenarios. Um, if you already have one limb that, that looks like it's a little bit lax, you can actually increase the laxity in that, trying to improve the uh, contracture on the other limb. So it's just something to think about when you're, you're looking at your treatment regimes. Uh, and then controlled exercise is very important. You want to strengthen these guys, <clears throat> but you don't want to overdo it. So you can't just you know, turn them out for, for 24 hours and expect them, you know, to still be the same muscle tone and uh, articulation as they were when you turned them out. So uh, applying, I'm just going to talk basically about applying the splints. So, uh, you know, it's basically arts and crafts hour for us. We uh, have a 16-inch cotton stereo roll or combine, a roll of vet wrap, elasticon, the cast material, uh, they've recently come out with a, a new splint material that's already covered with cotton that uh, is a little extra padded and it basically comes in a roll and we just cut it to length and it's a little bit quicker for us to, to get everything done and then duct tape and sedation. Um, these guys as very young neonates, they generally do very well with sedation. We lay them down, you know, we're going to be uh, putting a bit of pressure on this to get this splint and get full extension. Uh, I typically use Valium and uh, Butorphanol for these young guys. So once we figure out how much length we want, depending on the uh, f joints affected, be that the fetlock 
or the uh, coffin joint or the knee. Uh, once we find the length that we want, we uh, basically roll that out. And this is kind of our old method, our new one. Like I said, we just cut it to length and apply it. And then uh, dunk it in water, get it all uh, stuck together. And then we wrap the limb with elasticon. And there are some subtleties here that are very important when applying these. Uh, putting pressure in certain areas. I'm going to see if I can not mess up the pointer. So you'll see that you know, the hand placement is important. So if you were to put too much pressure pinpoint wise, you've got your flexor tendons back here. You could cause a rub or a bow, uh, a lot of things like that. Another important uh, area is here at the, the back of the bulbs. So uh, you know, it's gentle pressure. You're trying to bring that around without causing any pinpoint uh, dents basically in the cast. Uh, and another thing, we've just started doing this, but there are the occasional folds that will get white hairs from the pressure. Uh, you know, they're typically bandaged for a while, and uh, especially here in the fetlock region, we've started using our foam pads, like our laminitis foam pads, to uh, place between our knee and uh, the fetlock. So this is what it looks like afterwards. We just put some duct tape on it to seal out the manure and urine, things like that. Um, we typically do three days for sort of the average. Some respond after one or two, uh, some as many as five, but the average would be three splints. Uh, and you come back every day. And if uh, you, uh, you know, come back to this guy, so this, you know, responded well. Um, <coughs> what I would encourage is that you don't give up too early. So if you were to, uh, say, yeah, I think it's good enough, you know, but he's still just a little bit upright. Uh, sometimes you'll come back and you'll find yourself fighting a club feed on those. So if you're going to do it, do it all the way. <clears throat> Maybe that extra splint or that extra bit of bandaging uh, to get it where you really like it. So uh, just talking about knees, um, typically don't like to splint above the knee if we can help it. There are uh, certain instances of getting radial uh, nerve paralysis. It's usually temporary, but um, if you can get away, as long as the foal can stand and nurse, you can still bandage the knee, but splint the distal limb if you have flexion or uh, contractures distal to that, so be it at the fetlock or the coffin joint. Uh, you can still improve those guys, and oftentimes uh, you'll find when they're over at the knee that they'll improve over time on their own anyway. Like I said, just as long as they're able to stand a nurse and, and do their job in that manner.